Okay, we're back, and uh, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dan Conn, who's somebody we know really well, been involved in Happy Hour for many, many months. Uh, really cool guy. He's going to talk today about OPSEC and social engineering. So, Dan, welcome. Over to you. Thanks. Um, thanks for joining me on my first ever talk. Thanks to the beer farmers for giving me this opportunity as well. My name's Dan Conn. I'm currently studying a master's in advanced security and digital forensics at Edinburgh Napier. Um, and I've been coding for about eight years. And if you want to get in touch, my handles are on the slides there. So before I start, I'm just going to warn you, there's going to be some strong language and we will be talking about things of an adult nature, such as coercive actions under violence and drugs in nightclubs. So there aren't any graphic images around that, but I just want you to understand that you know, sometimes you can get triggered just by hearing some of this stuff. So if you feel it's unsuitable, now is the time to kind of, um, do, you know, find something else. Um, okay, so throughout my studies, there have been points where I've kind of thought, wow, you know, I've been doing this in my whole life and I've, I've never really known there was a term for it. Um, and two of those things have been OPSEC and social engineering. Two awesome definitions are on the slides. Um, and to paraphrase, social engineering is a means to obtain confidential information about a project and it could be protected by OPSEC. Uh, OPSEC is short for Operation Security, um, and OPSEC methods are the steps taken to ensure information remains confidential and secure. So the way I like to think about them both is, you know, they don't have to be both present for, for the other to work, but they certainly can use to counter each other if they're both present in, a, in an attack or defence. So this all sounds really pretty serious, right? I mean, why would I have been using this or even needing this growing up? Right, well, here's a little story. Let's go back to the 90s. It was a time of huge cavernous super clubs like Cream, the Hacienda, the Ministry of Sound, where DJs would play to filled arenas. It's a time of Britpop and indie dance where the Happy Mondays, Stone Roses and Oasis would be mad for it in Manchester, while Blur, Suede and Elastica were pretending to be Cockneys down south. Lad and Ladout culture combined with Cool Britannia was everywhere and, they, and it was embraced, rightly or wrongly. And then there's Little Kid Me, and I'm, I'm at the moment missing out on all the fun. I used to read dictionary front to back. I used to read technical manuals like novels, absorb books on science and history, but I loved it. Um, now I'm not shattering any illusions here, I hope, but let's be honest, you don't have pictures like this if you weren't a little bit nerdy, am I right? However, this little angelic nerd loved dance music. He grew up with it, he would listen to it on the radio, he just wish he was part of it. Um, imagine what a nightclub was, it sounded so much fun in his head. So I convinced myself I was gonna be a DJ, I write music for a living, be part of this culture. I got some really cheap record decks for my birthday. I learned piano, I practiced loads. Yeah, let's go. One slight snag. You've got to be 18 to be in these nightclubs. And although at this stage, I'm a little bit older than that photo, I'm only 12 or 30. So let's see how that would have panned out, right? Excuse me, can I come in? I'm 18, I promise. Not this decade, son, fuck off. And that was the response I got from most places. And rightly so. You know, hearing this from many places didn't deter me. You know, as we all know, when it comes to attacks, you only need one weak link um, to, to exploit. And, you, you know, eventually that was found. Excuse me, can I come in? I'm 18, I promise. What's your star sign? Aquarius? Yeah, in, in you go. The doorman let me in. <laughs> like, now, was this a feat of social engineering mastery? Like, did I convince the target that my squeaky voice and baby face might have belonged to someone who was 18 or older? No, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Turns out in the 90s, many pubs and clubs really didn't care about IDs or letting in children to drink there. There weren't the hefty fines for ser serving underage kids that there are today or the health warnings. As long as you could confidently provide a correct star sign, not a date of birth, a star sign that never changes year to year, you too could join in the fun. Yes. And wherever that I could, I definitely embraced that fun. I kept flyers as mementos that plastered my bedroom walls, and I still keep them to this day. Um, you know, first memories of kind of living a, a semi-adult life, and I absolutely loved it. Now, this wasn't going to happen every weekend, right? Getting in at this young age is very much a trial and error process, much like many red team activities today. You know, just because something worked last, last week doesn't mean it's going to work today. You know, I had to use reconnaissance. You know, what people were on the door that night? Did they let me in last time? Do they look like someone has annoyed them tonight? So how are they going to let me in today? You know, re reconnaissance helped me decide if an attempt was worth trying or not. And even when you get into the place, after a period of time, you might get thrown out or barred. Um, more because you've upset other patrons and they're threatening to report the pub or club, you know, if they didn't act. So this takes us to our first lesson of being environment aware. 
I was fortunate enough that my godfather was a pub landlord. So I'd grown up in pubs from near enough birth and was able to study how people acted in them. Yeah, how do you ask for a pint? How do you avoid getting barred? Most important in this situation, how are you going to raise suspicion that you might be underage? So looking sheepish in a corner, eyes looking up, hunched over, you know, sipping timidly on a pint, that's going to get you thrown out after a couple of weeks if you can't then give ID. You know, generally people don't look like that if they should be in, in there, you know. Conversely, you might think being a bit cocky, you know, a little bit arrogant might be indicative of a young 18 year old, but everyone's going to think, you know, they're a bit of a dick. So, you know, then they're going to want an ID just so they can throw you out. You know, just, just as looking like a stereotypical hacker probably will not get you into a corporate building, looking at a place in a pub is likely to get you thrown out too. So to social engineer, whether that be an office worker or a pub landlord, you need to look like you should be there, that your clothes don't look out of place for the surroundings, whatever that is, and that you have confidence, but not arrogance, so people take a dislike to you. Don't set off people's internal intrusion detection. So pubs and clubs are not the only environmental awareness, uh, the only place environmental awareness can help. And online use is with sock accounts. There are some really good sock accounts, and many are harmless and jovial, like this one, Scoot McGroody, made by McElroy. Scoot McGroody never breaks character, and has even got photographic evidence that he's real and Scott McGrady's brother, right? Seriously, from this picture, you definitely think they were brothers, and that's because the best socks, they assimilate well, they have a good story, and they never break character. Unlike this one, Andy 03494816, which tried to harass my friend Lisa Forte. They would dip in, ask something nice, and then start getting really nasty. You know, as time passed, it turned out they were a terrible sock account because they broke character so many times. You know, well, to be fair, they didn't have much character to break, which was equally hilarious. So we thought we'd give them a bit more depth to their character by giving them a more interesting story than their creator could actually manage. We decided that Andy was 48. He was an accountant. He was happily married and he lived in the home counties. He hated commuting. Who doesn't, right? But... We also gave him a proper name. Instead of Andy 03494-58816, we gave him the dignity of being called Andy Numbers. And this slide explains the full story. Let's digress a bit, it is quite funny. We were so unimpressed with the creator's lack of character, we gave Andy Numbers a credible story that was more challenging to us. So all their creator had to do was make notes, go along with it, and he even screwed that up. After every bout of nastiness, he would then delete all of his history as if he would forget everything that had taken place, and we would too, and that would never screenshot their antics for things like this, right? I guess they thought, you know, we would have a bout of amnesia if they deleted all their Twitter history, because that's how it works. You know, a bit like children, you know, that hide on the premise that if they can't see you, then you can't see them either. Well, anyway, Lisa suggested we should play around with what he had to say to see if he can remember what he actually had written in the, in the past. So we chose a name for his wife. Sarah and Lisa persuaded Andy Number that, that that was his wife's name. We then changed the CSS of the web page and screenshotted it to then call his wife Helen and that's what you see in the top right. Then we waited. Uh, the creator wiped all of Andy's history you know after being a bit nasty and then wanted to be friends again and as you can see he had no clue of what he should have been saying. They couldn't remember and in the end slipped up after we suggested that his wife was Helen and, and gave him the mock screenshot. And then afterwards, he, he tried to backpedal in the bottom bottom left and, you know, said Sarah was an ex. He got confused. I mean, who else forgets their wife's name for crying out loud? You know, you'd stick to your guns. You know, Andy's creator forgot the name of Andy's wife because he was just really sloppy. Um, so sloppy, in fact, that some more awesome people joined us and through some OSINT work, traced this all, all to a man behind the SOC account who I can't say any more, but happens to be a CISO, which was another interesting story. <laughs> Anyhow, back to our story, I digress. Um, a year passes, my 18 year old persona has been built. And my target is a pub that employs DJs. You know, I decide I should give a demo tape there and why not? They think I'm 18 or at least they pretend to, right? Let's do it. I got my first gig at a pretty rundown pub. You know, not as bad as the one in the photo, but not far off it, to be honest. Um, it was quite common to see a ball from the pool table end up in someone's face most nights I played there. Um, and when I first played there, I thought it was a really cool thing that the DJ booth was in a cage. But then I realised quite quickly it wasn't just for show. When I was getting a drink out the cage, I got very used to kind of ducking. Let's just put it that way. Um, now, after the pub shift ended, I'd obviously stop DJing. All the staff would go en masse to a nightclub. Um, and there was one I really wanted to go to, but I'd been rejected so many times. Um, 
and I didn't want to get turned away in front of everyone in the pub, risk not being able to play there even, as, as terrible as it was. Um, so if they were going to this particular club, I'd normally make excuses, slope off. Um, but after a few times of do, doing this, the bar manager insisted I joined. And, you know, it's one you can't really get out of. So I'm going along. I'm hoping it goes all right. But I'm really afraid that the end of my music career has happened before it's even started. So we turn up at the nightclub. The doormen are in suits. They look serious. If they were a tech company, to paraphrase the beer farmers, they would not need to tell people that they took security seriously. We get to the door. It's our turn. I'm trying not to shake. I'm trying not to sweat. I'm trying not to be sick on his nice black shoes. We just go in. And turns out the bar manager knows everyone, right? They trust him. I'm now trusted like a road certificate in a public key infrastructure. At a very high level, public key infrastructure, PKI, is a way that the user's public key is bound to an organization. You have root certificate authorities, CAs, which are considered trusted entities. And because of this trust, they then act as authoritative voices on the bindings they're aware of. So they do this by checking organizations and issuing digital certificates as a bond of their trust in an organization. In turn, CAs that aren't aware of the bindings can consult root CAs or another CA that's obtained information from them to check the integrity of an organization. And you can have many different root CAs and the most prevalent use of their trust is with the little green padlock in your favorite web browser. Um, but the important things to remember are that any CA can be a root CA. Just because one was trustworthy today doesn't even mean it's trustworthy tomorrow. And some don't even check their facts before they trust something. And this blind trust is what caused the Komodo PKI hack in 2011, which allowed a rogue organization to pretend where they were Google Mail, Hotmail, or Yahoo Mail, and loads of others. Yeah, they poisoned the PKI. And in a similar way, I poisoned the PKI of a nightclub. Human key infrastructure, HKI poisoning, right? <laughs> um, I was purporting to be an organization that was 18 years old and eligible to work. The bar manager where I DJ'd was a trusted entity for many others, so we'll call him a root CA. But they hadn't verified the facts. I wasn't 18, and asking for a passport or another way of verifying would, would have shown this, right? From the HKI poisoning, I gained the trust of the promoter of the nightclub. It gives me a staff VIP card. Great, more authentication and credentials. The door staff and bar staff now accept I'm 18 through the trust of the bar manager and the promoter. And going forward, if I got asked for ID anywhere, I'll just go, no, I'm afraid not, but I've got one of these. Present the card, walk in. The promoter also suggests that I should come to an open decks night and for the pre-club bar. So I'll win that. I'm now a resident DJ there. Great. So we all live happily ever after. The story ends and you wonder why I've spoken more and more about public key infrastructure than I have on OPSEC and social engineering. Ta -da! No, not quite yet. We're just getting started, to be honest. Let's continue. See, things are actually all right for quite a while. 15, 16, 17 year old me was happy that people bought my story. I was 19, 20, 21 now for them. Uh, whether or not it was truly the case, I, I don't know. But at the same time, I believed that my secrets, my OPSEC was, was robust. I kept playing every Saturday in the pre-club bar and there was a lot more friend. It was a lot more friendly and better paid than the rundown pub. Um, there was still a bit of violence, but door staff mainly stopped that. Um, people were generally friendly. I played my tunes. I went clubbing afterwards. Then I'd walk four miles home, absolutely plastered, carrying a silver steel record box filled with vinyl, mainly chosen as a part prop to let make sure other security teams would let me into their clubs. Even if I wasn't playing there, I'd just carry it around. I normally get home between five or six in the morning. Um, quite young as well um but some time passed and i started getting regular people come to hear me dj people shaking my hand at the end of sets I also started to get my first mate mentions in local paper club life sections like this one um other than the very sexist descriptions of various female customers the journalist writes about there is another problem i'm 17 and i'm still underage and things suddenly change quite rapidly and new threats start to emerge so whilst Things were very friendly in the pre-club bar, in the nightclub above, most of the time it's fine. Um, but every now and again, things would go, well, let's just call it a little bit strange. Um, and if anyone's heard the story of the legendary Hacienda nightclub in Manchester, you, you'll know that for a long time it was an amazing venue, providing the best that music of that time had to offer. And you'll also hear that it had to be closed in 1997 due to rival drug dealers, often in gangs, stabbing, shooting, not only each other, but people that worked there and, and innocent punters too. Um, I never went there, but I'm friends with people that did regularly, and they talk about it with such fondness, but also so much sadness of how it ended. Um, with our nightclub above, it was a pretty similar thing. You know, you had two gangs, mainly made up of grown-up men, 28 to 38 years old, uh, which now when I'm around that age, I find so bizarre, it's unreal. Um, and they all had 
pretty truly psychopathic tendencies. You know, for the most part, they're all very polite and friendly. However, underneath that smiling exterior, you can see in their eyes, you never want to really make them angry if you can help it. It's a really chilly free feeling that I can't really express, but it's omnipresent when they took speak to you. Um, and when they look at you, and sometimes they just torment people for fun. You know, uh, one minute they're joking, then they turn on the sixpence screaming at someone's face that they've offended them, then going back to joking to them for stupid for thinking that. Then if a person might crack a joke to go back, they might put their arm around them, they might glass them. You never knew, and it really wasn't nice. It's a bit like social media sometimes, but with physical pain too. So, along with DJing in the free club bar, I've now got a job in the club, on the lights. Great. So, for the most part, things are happy, but I also see some really horrific things. You know, one gang member knocks down this scrawny little kid, half their size, stamps their head into some huge metal studs like that, um, which hold the building structure in place. And, you know, luckily the kid survived, but it's a really broken way. He never found out if he fully recovered, but, it, you know, it's pretty horrific. So I've had to build another persona with a bit more depth, one that's a bit more tougher that could handle himself. Uh, it also took up boxing, you know, carrying 100 records four miles every week certainly helped build strength as well. Um, but I had to start thinking about strategies from an offset point where, you know, if things go too bad, do I use my record box as a weapon now, you know, if I need to, you know, really quite dark thoughts. And one day, one of the gang members has a great idea while I'm DJing. Oi, Dan, oi, you, you DJ, you, you never get your bag checked, do you? Right, well, if I give you some things, like, you can go past security and you can just give them back to me when you're out, yeah? And at this point, I feel sick. So I know what he means by things. And, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to end up in prison. Yeah. So I think I give him diversions. If I smile from the DJ booth like this and pretend that I can't hear him, then hopefully he'll just go away. And that worked. And that was good. But he came back every week, week after week, um, until one day, you know, I decide I finished playing. I go out to get some money out from a cash point down the road. And I see him behind me. And he comes out, Danny boy. I fucking hate being called Danny boy. Danny boy, about this favor, mate. You got to do it. I, mate, I don't know what you're on about. Danny boy, you know, and you better do it because everybody needs a favor, right? And you never know what's going to happen next, mate. Like, don't be a dickhead. So he's now pulled out a knife and he's, he's not waving it in my face. He doesn't need to. He's just playing with it. See, let me see how sharp it is and smirk. The omnipresent chilling eyes there, seeming to sack all strength from me so i take a deep breath i gulp and i, look, I just go to look I, I really want to help but i can't um if i get caught with that i'm i'm absolutely screwed um i don't want to go to prison i've got a lot of respect for you so i'm not lying to you and i, I really hope you respect that but i just can't do it and I'm, I'm really really sorry and i'm shaking while i say this i'm i'm not sure if i i could be sick but i feel very much like it and i feel so numb that i don't know what the rest of my body's doing so he looks up to me and is, is not really that happy at all. And he just goes, oh, don't worry, Danny boy, I'm only playing with you. <laughs> now, he wasn't, or was he? You know, I'll, I'll never know. Um, but my OPSEC now had to strengthen me even more. You know, it wasn't just lying about my age. It was making sure I never owed him a favour because he wants to call it back. You know, if he brought me a drink without me asking, I'd get him one straight back. Um, Anything that he could argue was a favour, despite me not asking for it, I'd make sure that slate was clean by the end of the night, like a game of cat and mouse. Um, I need to protect myself from owing him anything, and I'm very wary of it with other people that I don't know, even now, because you never know. You know contrary to popular belief, thanks for films, criminals sometimes don't have scars, they sometimes don't look evil, sometimes they don't even sound anything like Alan Rickman. And they look perfectly pleasant. They try and trap you into a situation. They try and convince you that there's no option but to comply. They try and socially engineer you and you need counter strategies to, to prevent that. And this wasn't the only worry either. You see, oh, see, <laughs> the legislation called the Licensing Young Persons Act 2000 suddenly increases fines for underage drinking to 5,000 pounds per individual involved in the sale. So instead of just the landlord, everyone gets fined. Um, the government's really serious at stopping underage drinking, you know, pub raids on pubs and clubs happen, this makes everyone know everything's going to change, you know, many young bar staff now personally liable, can't take a risk at losing that much money, insist they're protected, so door staff start asking doors for everyone, you know, passport, driver's license, get the fuck out. Luckily, thanks to my social engineering human key infrastructure poisoning, my VIP card still holds as much weight as the government document, yay, well for now anyway. You see, 
a new doorman joined the nightclub and they wanted things verified that were told to them. They were a proper root CA, you know, they did not work on trusting others. They took it upon themselves to seek the truth. Oh no. Based on the review in the paper, the pre-club bar also got some flyers printed with my name on it. And we had special guests would do the early part of the night you know, with me following. And I thought this was great. I loved it. You know, but I, I didn't think how it could actually be used against me. And that's my actual name on there. And I'm under 18. And there aren't that many people with the surname COD in the UK, let alone Sussex. So as a way of highlighting how much of an OPSEC fail this was, you know, here's a listing from 192.com for Dan J. Cons that it's aware of in the UK. And now there's four Sussex addresses on there and they're all me. Um, by the way, definitely look up yourself on 192.com because even though I've opted out of the open register, therefore should have none of my details given to a business, 192.com kept the data of my addresses before I opted out and it tells you where I have lived according to the electoral roll. And for a few pounds, you can get some credits and decide to get an in-depth background report on someone that provides all of their full addresses along with convenient maps with the rough value of each house and who asked those of them for a pivot? You know, luckily to delete your data from there, it only takes 24 hours. Now, 192.com didn't exist when our detective doorman was refusing to blindly trust our, our human key infrastructure. Instead, we had the phone book. You know, the phone book still exists. It's a register of everyone's name, address, and landline number, providing a NIX directory. Uh, now, I'm not in the phone book, and I certainly wasn't this time. So that's great OPSEC, right? Well, not in this situation, no. Just to paint a scene, I'm now two months off my 18th birthday. Lots of pubs and clubs are demanding ID. I've lost quite a few gigs now with security and now demanding it from people that you know, rock up to gigs. Um, and even my still silver record box suggesting to them that I'm playing, they're not buying it anymore. They're, they're still asking, why would they do that? You know, it's harder for me to get a drink now than what it was when I was 14. The only places I can get served without hassle are the pre-club bar where my residency is and the club joined to it. So I'm panicked all the time that I will get found out and lose even those gigs and then everything. You know, I'm, warned, I'm, I'm worried about gang members that I'm avoiding, try not to owe them a favour in case they want me to pay them back. My OPSEC is taking absolute battering and I'm getting desperate. Just two more months, keep this persona going, then you can play in other clubs legally, all's going to be fine. Anyway, this detective doorman says, it's weird, you know, I really can't find Con in the phone book. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> got to think of a diversion um yeah yeah really well it's, it's not weird really you know I, I live with my parents like a lot of 21 year olds you know yeah but you're also not on the electoral roll you know I've looked there as well oh really how'd you do that that's that's interesting I did not plan for that uh, well uh, that's that's because I, I don't vote you know I want to see your passport next week uh, well, you see, I, I don't have a valid passport, you know, I, I got it sent off to get renewed, but due to the backlog of the Millennium, millennium bug, yeah, um, I, I still haven't had it back, so it's stuck in Newport Gwent where the password, passport office is, and, you know, I, I'll try and phone them and nothing comes back, you know, nothing. Um, now, this story sounds as implausible as an eye test in Durham Castle, right? Um, there was a processing backlog at the time, and is there still at this point? You know, me giving the passport office location sounds like unnecessary fact trying to divert and keep authority to a pack of lies. But, you know, he's not being social engineered. He's seen that this is a pack of lies. Detective Dorman smirks, you know, he's not buying it, but he humours me. Well, when do you think you're going to get it back? Um, well, well, you know, I'm, I'm not the government, you know. Um, oh, I'd imagine uh, two months' time. <laughs> two months, really? Oh, well, it, it better be. And that was that. You know, the agreement was my passport to come back in two months when I then finally would be 18. I'm still using diversion and personas to socially engineer people to allow me to stay playing. I'm still trying to keep my secrets safe through my very fragile OPSEC and just hoping no one digs too deep at this point. Um, so, yes, quite clearly mistakes made. But I think I did pretty well keeping all this stuff under wraps for three years. Um, I learned how to create personas and adapt them to convince people to form actions that they might not have wanted to otherwise. I stay confident, but not arrogant. Um, well, maybe not in the final year. I mean, what 17 year old is, is not arrogant, right? But anyway, I've, I forgot about freely available information and I forgot to factor that into my personas. Um, you know, using open source intelligent OSINT to find information about yourself and what you need to delete or change is, is really important. You know, we, we also learned to create believable characters. My 21 year old persona was probably not that believable. Andy numbers definitely wasn't believable. Um, but most importantly, don't do crime. You know, I'm glad I chose not to. I would have had my life ruined at 17. Um, 
and I wouldn't be talking to you today. I'd either be in prison or maybe dead. Um, and it might not seem that way, but there is almost always another option if you talk to people. So before I leave, uh, I, you know, I'd just like to say thanks for everyone for listening. Thanks to all the beer farmers and sponsors for putting this on. Um, thanks to awesome mentors and goons who have worked tirelessly putting on Zoom prep chats, giving advice where needed. Um, you know, and also our fellow speakers who have been backing each other up, you know, letting each other prep in that mentoring thing as well. It's been truly awesome. Yeah, special thanks to Lisa Forte for reading through my slides so many times and giving me advice to Shupek for even updating the quote that you saw earlier from his from his article in 2017 to make it more accurate and providing some good advice to Team Standard Day and Crofting for your awesome support during lockdown and also Infosec Happy Hour for that. Um, uh, but most importantly, to my family and to my lovely wife, Nina, who allows me to do things like this, prepare for them, push me every day. Um, if you want, there's some further reading. Um, these are all places, you know, either blogs or you know, articles that are really, really good. Um, so I highly recommend them. Thanks. Perfect, Dan. Thank you very much. <laughs> really good. Again, a story, you know, and, and that's really what, what it's all about, with sharing your, your adventures. And <laughs> in your case, some of the adventures have been pretty bloody scary. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic. Have we got any questions for Dan? None came through from the audience. Everyone was just laughing constantly, all the little <laughs> subtle humor hints and stuff. Um, just from my point of view, I, and I think Mike's and Ian's, um, the people that were ex musicians, I guess, or current musicians and kind of drifted into InfoSec for <laughs> other reasons. Yeah, I we've been in the same position, man. We've been right there. I've been the underage kid playing in a bar, kicking other underage kids out because I'm like, if you get busted, they're gonna start asking me for ID. And yeah, we've we've been there, man. Like the, the pubs I played in were equally rough, and I think I've told you a few stories. And you know, you'd, we weren't paid in cash; we were paid in a box of beer and a bag of Things. candy. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, that was that was the going rate right for a band, and it was cheaper than paying as cash but no a, a really really brilliant talk um there is questions now coming in people have actually went oh shit okay get the questions in before so, you do the question scott um go for it. you can't see this but i've got a scar that's about an inch and a half long on my inside of my elbow here i got that in the hacienda really yeah <laughs> yeah um oh, be wow. careful be careful when you knock over somebody's drink is the yeah. lesson that i learned that night but yeah scott questions that's <laughs> a uh, so, yeah, yeah good piece of advice for life really um but yeah from juan he's asked what strategies can you recommend for strengthening your opsec what would you recommend as a starting point i would say first stop would be going to that opsec is for everyone not just people something hide article and do pretty much everything in there that that she kind of recommends you know but going going through certainly just googling stuff you know google docs would be a best one you know seeing what what is actually out there on you and deleting it <laughs> you know um, but also you know kind of you know being a bit sensible with it you know there are some times that you're going to need to have stuff about you online you know if you you know I've got, I've got people that i work with for example who have absolutely nothing online but then wonder why they have nothing to show so maybe if they go for a job interview or you know you, you've got to find a balance which is you know that you're giving some information out but you're not necessarily giving your address i mean certainly if you're on instagram or something be very wary you know take photos inside by all means um unless you're going to give them to cyber viking or rag but you know um, you know don't do them outside your house because um you know your how your outside your house is very unique a lot of the time and you know people can find you or certainly you know quite easily Oh, thanks. Um, that's all the questions from Slack. Just there's a outpouring twitch of people just going, laughing at various comments you made, <laughs> um, or absolutely agreeing and and saying someone just said the trip by article was very informative. Um, no, honestly, like I totally get it. Um, it's not difficult to find me. It's not difficult to find past music relationships. It bugs me. I've just learned to live with it. Um, luckily, I've got a brooder who uh, takes <laughs> most of the flack now, which is excellent. But um, no, Dan, that was excellent. Mike, Sean, do you want to jump in? No, yeah. Great talk. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and it's all another thing I'll say is that it's always great when you can draw a parallel between things in normal 
air quotes, normal life mm. and information security because it, it brings a, a narrative and a context that makes it a lot easier for people to understand because you didn't really talk about InfoSec particularly apart from PKI. Yeah. <clears throat> the interesting point was the HKI stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah. And that's the bit where you draw the line between human behavior and their information security and their, and their OPSEC and, and obviously in, in the social engineering aspects of it. So, Dan, it was brilliant. Absolutely hats off to you. And thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to go and get a beer now. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy.